Well, Dan, thank you very much indeed for having me here. Uh, it's wonderful to be in beautiful Brisbane. It's fantastic to see so many of my fellow Australians gathered together, maskless, uh, not socially distanced, and looking upon each other as people that can add something to their lives rather than infect them with a deadly disease. So thanks uh, for defying the scaredy cat mindset, uh, which has done so much to blight our lives over the last two years. Now, Dan, I want to say that, uh, yes, this great city of Brisbane should have its own think tank. And all credit to uh, uh, the AIP for the work that you've done. Uh, but I do want to say that uh, uh, there's several people in this room who are substantial contributors to existing think tanks, such as the Institute of Public Affairs, where I am a fellow. Don't stop contributing. <laughs> do not stop contributing. Uh, it's both and, not either or, when it comes to supporting uh, the important uh, centre-right think tanks of our country. Now, I do want to say, uh, before I go on to some issues, uh, how pleased I am uh, to be in such company. Uh, all of you being here are delightful, but there are a couple of people who I want particularly to acknowledge. Uh, obviously, David Crisofurli, uh, the Queensland Opposition Leader and all of his parliamentary colleagues who are here. Thank you uh, for being here in support of the AIP and a better polity more generally. Uh, it's wonderful that Andrew Lamming, uh, my former colleague, still in the Federal Parliament, is here. Uh, it's great to see my old friend Ashley Goldsworthy, who has been a lion of good causes, including a federal president of the Liberal Party. Uh, I've agreed to uh, provide some commentary on Ashley's memoirs, which are just about to be released, hopefully to a wider rather than just a select audience. But wonderful, Ashley, to have you here and thank you for all you've done. It's fantastic to be in the presence of my former colleagues, Larry Anthony and Gary Johns. Larry, you are someone who, in your post parliamentary life, has contributed magnificently to public life, uh, as well as being a success in private life. And Gary, you are living, breathing proof that there are good people on both sides of the parliamentary <laughs> fence. Perhaps fewer good people on both sides now than there were then. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, thank you for all you did in Parliament and subsequently. And I should finally, uh, while I'm in the business of offering special acknowledgements, say what a pleasure it always is to be with my friend Bill Glasson, one of the most capable people uh, to volunteer for public life, uh, but thus far at least not enter it. Um, I, I was uh, a successful health minister. Um, I'll leave people to judge uh, the success of my tenure in other positions. Uh, but to the extent that I was a successful health minister, it was to a very great extent because I had a wonderful president of the AMA uh, in support. And Bill is probably the last federal president of the AMA to work successfully and harmoniously with a coalition health minister. So thank you, Bill, uh, for all you've done. I, I do want uh, also, I suppose, uh, uh, to observe that we have just lived through the weirdest two years of our lives. Uh, not without some justification, uh, but nevertheless, uh, often enough, I think that things have gone uh, completely over the top. And while uh, here in this room, uh, we're free to uh, go about our business and to mingle together, uh, we are still in the midst of a form of vaccine apartheid, uh, as demonstrated by the legal absence today uh, of the person, uh, Graham Young, uh, who put this event together. Um, I, uh, I really do uh, despair sometimes 
at the way things are going. Um, if the social security records are right, we have something like a million working age Australians uh, who won't work. And if these vaccine mandates are persevered with, we will then have something like a half a million working age Australians who can't work because for whatever reason, uh, they would rather not vaccinate themselves. Now, I think people should get vaccinated. Um, I've had my three jabs. Um, but in the end, people should be free uh, to make their own decisions about their own health. And it appalls me uh, that contemporary Australia has so departed from the sorts of things that until very recently uh, we would have taken for granted. Now, I want to do uh, a couple of things today. <laughs> and I suppose I should confess, uh, first of all, that uh, just as it's a dangerous thing for a, re for a recovering alcoholic uh, to visit a pub, it's probably an even more dangerous thing for a recovering politician uh, to maintain an ongoing interest in public life. And yet I am not prepared to give up altogether. So the first thing I want to do today is to praise David Chrysofuli uh, for the job he is doing as opposition leader, and in particular, to acknowledge that David appears to be one of the very few contemporary opposition leaders who appreciates that the first job of an opposition is to oppose. You do not get elected by making weak compromises with bad governments. Uh, political leaders do not face coronation, they face a contest. And a contest is exactly what David Christofuli has made things here in Queensland over the last few months. Uh, you know, it's a very rare Labor government that doesn't at some point, uh, particularly as it's getting longer in the tooth, try to rot the system, uh, try to uh, uh, politicise the public service. And uh, the way that uh, David Chrysofuli uh, has leapt on, uh, the evidence that we've seen just in the last week or so uh, of uh, a kind of corruption at the heart of the current government, uh, it really is the first time that the Palaszczuk government uh, has looked in trouble. Good on you, David. Keep it up. And I know... <laughs> ..that not only will you be absolutely vigilant uh, in exposing the rorts, the rackets and the rip-offs, which deserve to be exposed by an opposition whenever a government of whatever persuasion is guilty of them, uh, but you will also go to the next election with a clear alternative position so that everyone in this state will know how things will be different and better uh, should the government change. Now, the second thing I want to do today is to reassure people that notwithstanding the current uh, political difficulties in Canberra, the next election is certainly winnable by the Morrison government. Uh, anyone who watched uh, the Prime Minister uh, a couple of days ago in the press cl club, I think, would be struck uh, by the fact that uh, he hasn't tried to pretend uh, that everything has gone swimmingly over the last couple of years. Uh, most of us have had our grumbles over the last couple of years, uh, sometimes quite justified grumbles. And uh, there are certainly times when I have asked myself, how is it? Uh, that we are spending more than ever before, we are restricting more than ever before, uh, and yet in many states and in Canberra, we have Liberal governments. And yet, as the Prime Minister made crystal clear, uh, extraordinary times do demand extraordinary measures. Uh, and even the strongest principles uh, sometimes need to defer uh, to even stronger principles. So I absolutely accept uh, that this has been a difficult time. Uh, and I think that any fair-minded observer would have to concede that whatever mistakes we've made 
uh, in Canberra. Uh, we have done as well as could reasonably have been expected under the circumstances. And the one thing uh, that you can be absolutely sure of is that taxes will always be lower, regulation will always be lighter, and government will always be smaller and more efficient under the coalition. Now, if every Labor member of parliament was like Gary Johns, that might be different. But sadly, that hasn't been the case uh, for some time. So I think we can be confident, those of us on the centre right of politics, uh, that in an election which is a choice, there is a clearly preferable alternative. Uh, and while I hear lots of people say, shouldn't the Liberals be better? Uh, to which I say, of course, but shouldn't all of us be better? In the real world, we do not get to choose a perfection. We just get to choose the best that is available at that time. And certainly, uh, given a choice between Scott Morrison and the Coalition and Anthony Albanese uh, and the Labor Party as things stand today, I have no doubt where good people uh, should, should, should go. The next thing I want to do uh, is to reassure all of you who sometimes might think that the world has gone slightly crazy over the last couple of decades that you are not alone. <laughs> Now, I accept that we only have one planet and we have to do everything we reasonably can to keep it in the best possible condition for our children and our grandchildren. But you know, what's the point of turning our economy and our society upside down to reduce emissions uh, if China uh, emits more, uh, the increase in China is greater in a single year uh, than the total emissions of this country. And what's the point uh, of uh, transforming our power system uh, if we only have power when the sun shines and the wind blows? You cannot have a modern economy based on intermittent renewable energy. So by all means, let's do what we can, but let's not forget the absolute realities on which the world uh, continues to turn. And look, I would be the first to admit that we have got to be full of sympathy and compassion uh, for people, particularly people who might feel like they're trapped in the wrong body. But having fought so long uh, for the recognition of women, surely we are not going to say that a woman is anyone uh, who says they are. Um, in the end, we have to accept that there are certain fundamentals uh, of biology which simply can't be altered. And you know, I'd be the last to say that our record here uh, as a nation uh, since, two, since 1901 or since 1788 is absolutely perfect. Um, we've all heard the stories of the Queensland Mounted Police, for instance, and all sorts of things that should never have happened. And yet the story of this country is of the development uh, of a place uh, as free, as fair, and as prosperous as any on earth. A country that we should be so incredibly proud of. And yes, uh, we can be better tomorrow than we are today, but never ever have minorities in this country, or indeed in uh, much of the rest of the English-speaking world, had a better deal than now. So yes, while every day we should be dedicating ourselves to improvement, please let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Please ensure that the cultural self-loathing, so much in evidence in attempts to change the date of Australia Day, in attempts to change the flag and change the constitution, does not penetrate our soul uh, and corrupt our appreciation of everything that this country has achieved. The final thing I want to do, the final thing I want to do is obviously uh, commend to you uh, the book uh, on sale here. And I don't ask you to buy it because I've got a chapter in it 
I ask you to buy it because, and I, and I don't just ask you to buy it, I urge you to read it, uh, because in the end, it's not just the politicians and the academics and the uh, people elected to uh, serve in various leadership capacities who shape the nation. Uh, each one of us has a part to play, whether it's in our own families, whether it's in our workplaces, our neighbourhoods, in all of the community associations to which we belong. And if we arm ourselves with the best facts and the best arguments, we will be agents for change for the better. We will be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Now, I want to finish on this note. Uh, anyone who grew up uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War uh, and has lived through uh, to the current times has enjoyed the best of human history. At no time prior to this have people been as free, as prosperous and as safe. But we can never assume that good times are automatic. We can never assume that good times will last. Uh, Europe is stalked uh, by the prospect of major war, war between nation states for the first time in seven decades. Our own region is haunted by an aggressive superpower uh, that could easily lunge out uh, to uh, destroy a vibrant democracy of almost 25 million people uh, just because it's within 100 miles or so uh, of its own mainland. Uh, trust me, if any of these things were to happen, the world that we, that we have known would be radically destabilised. And under such circumstances, uh, the pandemic that we've just lived through, uh, the climate change that we fear, uh, would seem like very, very small challenges indeed. And that's why, when all is said and done, each of us have got to fortify ourselves to face the challenges ahead, whatever they might be. Uh, they might continue to be the challenges of plenty. They might continue to be the challenges of prosperity, but they might also start to become the challenges of adversity that our forebears had to face and so magnificently overcame. So please, fortify yourselves, strengthen your minds, strengthen your hearts, strengthen your souls, read this book, on cancel culture and resolve to ensure that no one gets cancelled ever again uh, for the sorts of reasons they've been cancelled lately. <laughs>